G'day everyone, I'm Ebony Bennett, Deputy Director at the Australia Institute and welcome to our webinar series. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm very excited because I'm back here in the office, restrictions have lifted in Canberra. Um, I think we're closing in on 95% uh, double vaccinated here, so I'm just excited to be around people again. It's very great. I want to begin by acknowledging that I live and work on Ngunnawal and Ngambri country, uh, that sovereignty was never ceded and this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. And I pay my respects to the traditional owners and to elders past and present. Um, I also want to remind you all that the Australia Institute does these webinars at least weekly, but days and times obviously do vary. So please make sure that you register at australiainstitute.org.au. You'll find all the details of our upcoming webinars uh, on the website. And just a few tips before we begin to help things run smoothly today. If you hover over the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should be able to see a little box called Q&A, where you can ask questions of our panellists, and you should also be able to upvote questions um, and make Make comments on other people's questions as well. Um, and uh, just a reminder that this is being recorded and it will go up on our YouTube page and our website afterwards. And just a reminder, keep things civil and on topic in the chat or we'll boot you out. We don't have to do it often, but we will if we have to. All right, so all eyes are on Glasgow at the moment, but it's worth remembering that all around the world and here in Australia, the pandemic isn't over. States are lifting restrictions at various rates, but it's taking some states quite some time to reach the high vaccination rates that we're enjoying here um, in Canberra specifically. Uh, so those kind of results are, are staggered when it comes to lifting restrictions. Australia's vaccine rollout was supposed to prioritise vulnerable communities, including older Australians, Aboriginal communities, people with disabilities, people in aged care, but a lot of that promise turned out to be false. So we're just going back today to have a look at the pandemic uh, response at the vaccine rollout and quarantine, uh, because our Chief Economist Richard Dennis has written the cover essay for this episode, episode this issue of the monthly should be in all good bookstores and news agents at the moment about some of the failures of um, the pandemic response in Australia and along those lines I'm delighted to introduce our three guests today Dr Richard Dennis is of course our chief economist at the Australia Institute he's a prominent economist author and public policy commentator author of several books including Econobabble and Dead Right How Neoliberalism Ate Itself and What Comes Next and obviously our author of the cover issue of this month's issue of the monthly. Elle Gibbs is a disability advocate and writer. She's an award-winning writer, uh, disabled person and disability advocate. She was awarded the Leslie Hall Award for Lifetime Achievement in the National Disability Leadership Awards in 2020, specifically for her work on COVID support for disabled people and continues to work um, for access to vaccines. Elle writes regularly about the NDIS, social issues and disability for a variety of outlets. Um, I've recently been reading a lot of her work in Crokey, so you can check that out there. And Brendan Adams is manager at Wilcania River Radio. He's been involved in First Nations media, film and tourism for over 30 years. He's a proud Kuku Yalangi Wapabara man from far north Queensland. And he worked up in Townsville before moving to the small outback town on Barkindji country. Um, that might be known as Wilcania in New South Wales to some of you, where he obviously works at Wilcania River Radio. He and his team in 2019 won the Tony Staley Award for Excellence in Community Broadcasting for their coverage of issues relating to the Murray-Darling Basin. And his work also includes facilitating numerous projects that address the challenges and barriers faced by First Nations people. And obviously we're gonna talk to Brendan a lot about uh, his work in the community today. So welcome Richard, L, and Brendan. Thanks so much for joining us today. Richard, I wanted to start with you first. Why did you think it was important to write this essay? And what are some of the things that you think it's really important for people to know about how Australia's pandemic response rolled out? Uh, well, thanks, Eb, and, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, why did I write the essay? Because, well, COVID has disrupted uh, our society, uh, health outcomes, our economy in a way like nothing else. And while we grew kind of uh, familiar with and at times tired of daily accounts of how many people had got the virus and what the reproduction rate was. We got daily updates of all the little stuff, but it occurred to me that we weren't really stepping back and say, 
what happened. And while we started to have a conversation about vaccination, and again, we got the daily, how many people got the jab, we weren't really talking about who got the jab. So I, my, I guess my instinct was that as with everything in Australia, inequality would be at the heart of the vaccination rollout. Uh, so I guess my hypothesis was uh, that, that rich, well-educated people probably got vaccinated first. Uh, and then, uh, you know, if that was the case, why? Especially because the Prime Minister had made it clear that the opposite would be the case. We were going to target frontline workers. We were going to target border workers, we were going to target the most vulnerable groups, including Indigenous communities. So, so we kind of heard all the right words, but even from a, a, a sort of just a casual glance suggested the opposite had happened. So, yeah, I thought, well, you know, what, what, what other role could there be for an economist than to dive into the data and see what we could find? Yeah, and just to stay with that, I mean, um, today obviously we're going to go a lot into the failures. You've called it probably one of the worst public policy failures. What are some of the key things that you think the government got wrong? Oh, they, they basically the, the Commonwealth government in particular really got it all wrong. Uh, the early stages of COVID in Australia, uh, well, I'll go back a step. We've had the tyranny of distance in Australia since uh, since colonialisation. We've always kind of told ourselves it was a disadvantage to be so far from the, the countries that we care the most about. Uh, but actually, in this case, we had a huge head start because of that. Uh, and our state governments and our federal government handled the early stage as well. Uh, there's no doubt about that. And that saved tens, probably hundreds of thousands of lives in Australia. If, if, if the first wave of COVID went through Australia, the way it went through the US and the UK, terrible things would have happened here. And we actually dealt well with the hardest bit, a brand new virus that we didn't know much about. We actually did a good job of that. But then even though, so from the, and from the very early stages, people were working on vaccines and it, it sort of at best, it was gonna take a year to get a vaccine. So we had a year to think about what will we do when the vaccines show up? We had a year to think, how will we prioritise access? How will we roll it out? And actually what we did was quite disastrous. So in, in descending order, the big mistakes we made were we, we never built the dedicated quarantine centres. And let's never forget that an unvaccinated uh, frontline limo driver was the, the person that brought Delta into Sydney and then Canberra and Melbourne. Not only was he unvaccinated, he wasn't wearing a mask, wasn't required to. And of course he was driving some, uh, an air crew uh, from an airport to a private hotel. When of course, if we'd built dedicated quarantine centers, no such trip would be necessary. So if we had a dealt with quarantine effectively, there wouldn't have been a limo driver. If the limo driver in June, had it been vaccinated in the way Scott Morrison said they would be, because in March we were rolling it out to frontline border workers first, if they had been vaccinated, they probably wouldn't have got it. Uh, and of course, if he was wearing a mask, it would have been even less likely. So the whole Delta outbreak really comes from those three failures. They should have been going straight to a quarantine centre, not a private hotel with bad air conditioning. He should have been vaccinated first or not been allowed in that very dangerous job. And he should have been wearing a mask, probably driving a vehicle specifically designed for the purpose. Now, at the time that outbreak set out, we were already millions of doses behind the schedule the Prime Minister spelled out in March that year. So really, if we had have rolled it out as fast as Scott Morrison had planned, if we had a rolled it out in, as targeted as Scott Morrison had said it would be, we probably wouldn't have had the outbreaks that shut down Sydney and Melbourne and Canberra this year. Mm. Brendan, I want to come to you next. Richard in his essay talks about uh, Will Kenya being uh, a very disadvantaged community, that it was well known that communities like that would have trouble if the virus ever got in there. Um, last year, the Australia Institute talked to Aboriginal community controlled health organisations 
um, who had done just a simply amazing and world leading job at protecting those communities themselves and making sure the virus didn't enter. Um, we heard from the Prime Minister that communities like Wilcannia were supposed to be priorities, yet we saw that situation where an outbreak happened there. You were there in the community at the time. What was what was that like for you? What was the community experiencing? Well, you know, our community, we were always um, more or less afraid and we were also, you know, really, you know, what um, impact the COVID could do what, if it ever came into our community, uh, especially in our places of rural Kenya. We sit on a major highway. We know how much traffic, you know, travels through on a daily basis, averaging around about 850 uh, vehicles travel per day. So the, the risk was very high for us. So we, we, we wanted to make sure that we had um, uh, the government to come to listen to us so that we can have local solutions. And I think this is kind of where it really kind of failed in area. But going back to your question, you know, the once uh, the the COVID did come into, it was like I describe it as a cyclone. Um, and, and if you've ever been in a cyclone, you can you can be fully aware that you know it will it's coming, but you don't know how much damage it could do and when it actually hits. And that's what it did to our community. Uh, the moment it hit it, it, we were so unprepared for it. Um, the government did not have any appropriate st strategies or plannings to uh, prevent um, or protect our people at that time. And when I mean our, our people, I'm talking about First Nations as well as our local community people, because you know we're a very small community and the whole town is a family. So you know we, you know, the community. Um, to its credit, had to be the one to improvise, had to be the group to say, stand up, we've got to deal with this emergency. Um, at the time, you know, we had a lot of issues that we knew was going to um, uh, impact with the COVID. Uh, and, the, and the prime example was our overcrowding crisis we have in, in our community, social housing, not enough. Um, when people were uh, positive, there was no uh, alternative accommodation that we could provide for them and everything. So for our community, we had to try to find what can we do right now to address it. During that time, you know, the, um, the, uh, the uh, rollout, vaccination rollout was prioritised for our community, but it was never, it was never discussed on a local level. You know, they, they said this, it is a priority, but in our community, you know, we had local solutions. We had, we knew how our community could be, you know, have the rollout effectively. But unfortunately, nothing was planned um, through um, our local uh, community, our, our leaders. There was um, health organisations, but they are based um, 200 kilometres outside. So the engagement was very um, minimal. Um, so we had all of that. Uh, the, the rollout was very low. I think at the time um, when the impact came, we only had about five five of our First Nations people um, taking the vaccination. So there was a lot of confusion. Social media was a large part of presenting the negative um, about the vaccination. And a lot of our community, and including myself, you know, we're hearing that um, at the time, you know, the um, astrogenic, um, you know, the, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I got lifts. Sorry, everyone, it's really hard for me at times. But um, that, that, that we heard a lot of negative about people with the blood clot. Um, but there wasn't enough information saying, you know, there was 170,000 um, uh, vaccinations with that and only five passed away. We just heard people were passed away. And for our First Nation people, this was a really big um, concern because... As you know, we we deal with chronic illness on a on a daily basis. We have higher rates with diabetics, um, heart failures, uh, cholesterols, um, amongst a lot of others. So, not knowing exactly what these vaccinations can do positively, but also um, what um, side effects they could do, this created um, a lot of hesitations and everything. So. 
during that time, you know, and this is where our radio station became a very intrigued part, we had to get uh, the right people in to give us, give our community the right information. We had health professionals, we had the local police um, coming in, giving us the right information. But unfortunately, when you're on radio, even though we've got 85 to 90% of people listening to us, that doesn't mean they're listening to us the whole period. So they might have missed out on these moments. So we actually had to go, well, we need all of our community. So with the Royal Flying Doctors and where am I health, they had to come in and we had to have a community consultation, sit there with that with our elders, especially in our young people, asking the very important questions, um, you know, especially about their own health and, you know, and, and, and our vulnerable people. So when we got the right information, um, in this community consultation, then it, then we saw the changing of the attitude and once yeah. again, including myself. And then we started having the, um, we started seeing our people getting the, um, the uh, first dose happen happening. It was steadily rising and everything. But during that time, we went from having one little family of three going into uh, being positive to 153 people over the extent of the two months. Um, and that yeah, I might come back to you in just a, a tick to talk about that in more detail. Yeah. But L, I want to come to you next um, because what Brendan's describing, how the community really had to step up, is that the same experience that people's people with disability have had during this pandemic? Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Ebony and Richard. And Thank you so much, Brendan, for telling that story about what's been happening in Wilcannia. Um, so I'm coming to you from Wiradjuri country in central west New South Wales. Um, and yes, a lot of the story of both the pandemic and the vaccine response has been about how our community has had to do it for ourselves because we've been not only ignored but actively excluded from the pandemic response both initially uh, last year but then very specifically this year during the vaccine. So. Um, disabled people who live in group homes and in aged care, so that's people under 65, um, were meant to be part of phase 1A of the vaccine rollout. So the very, very first lot of people who were going to get the vaccine. Um, but by May, there was a total of 127 people who were fully vaccinated out of that. I mean, group. that's mind boggling, isn't it? Yep. So that group is 27,000 people. So it's not an enormously large group of people. But as we found out during the Royal Commission, uh, that the health department had got that completely wrong. They didn't know how many people that were in that group. They didn't know where they lived. They assumed everybody lived in large residential institutions and not in group homes. Um, so decisions were made to deprioritize us, but that wasn't told to anyone. But it was really clear earlier this year that that's exactly what had happened because we kept getting reports from people on the ground saying, I can't get access to the vaccine. I can't get an appointment. None of the uh, uh, places where the vaccine is available are accessible for me. And similarly, when that decision was made about AstraZeneca, that had a huge impact because the misinformation was rife. Um, there was very little information provided in accessible formats. And there was no information specifically directed to people with disability and people with disability in that particular group of 27,000 people. So look, I'm in phase 1B because I'm immunocompromised. And so, um, but even I had, and I have lots of advantages, but I had a huge amount of barriers to actually getting access to the vaccine, as did many of my peers. And so there was a whole lot of kind of crowdsourcing of information that went on because trying to find out where the vaccines were available, what kind of accessibility there was about vaccine centres, um, what the eligibility criteria were, and none of that was available from the government. Yeah. Um, Brendan and Elle, I'm going to come back to you about that community response a little bit more. But Richard, in the essay, you kind of talk about that it was clear that at some point, without telling anyone, the Morrison government simply gave up on 1A and 1B and prioritising certain, you know, uh, communities for the vaccine. But that didn't happen for everyone. You talk about how Qantas had access to the vaccine, um, private school boys from, I think it was St. Joey's, apologies if I've got the name wrong of that school. Uh, what happened there? Yeah, well, exactly. What happened there? And we don't know, but let's, let's go back a step. To prioritise means to put one group ahead of the other. That's what it means. 
And we were told that we were going to prioritize certain groups, indigenous groups, people with disabilities, frontline workers. Now it's very easy to tell if a group was prioritized because if a group was prioritized, it would have higher vaccination rates than the general population. Like this is not complicated. But what do we know sitting here in November today? We know that today Indigenous groups are still have lower vaccination rates than the general population. We know that people with disabilities have lower vaccination rates than the general community. So what happened was, uh, you know, and I, I really I do hope people read the essay because uh, what Scott Morrison did for a year was uh, just radically change not just his mind, but he tried to change our memories of what had happened. So in January, he said, there's no rush. Not, he, didn't, he didn't say it's not a race yet, but in January he said, let's do this carefully, let's do this slowly, let's do this the right way. I'll come back to you with a plan soon. But he literally said on January 1 this year, don't rush this, let's do it safe, let's do it good. And then he said, he, he did his, you know, it's not a race stuff. That was months later. It wasn't an accident. It was a whole strategy. We're going to do it slow. We're going to do it right. But then at some point, the politics shifted. And rather than doing it slow and doing it right, Morrison just wanted to get people vaccinated fast. So imagine you're the captain of a ship and there's 100 people on the ship and some of them are babies and some of them are kids and some of them have disabilities and some of them can't swim and you're in charge of handing out the life jackets before you put people into the boats and you don't have enough life jackets so you have to prioritise. So Scott Morrison started by saying, oh, it's going to be you know, children and metaphorically children, you know, and people who can't swim first. But once he decided that getting to 80% was the KPI, he did the opposite. He literally said, whoever can run fastest to the vaccination centre, we're open for business. So it wasn't an accident that the groups that were allegedly prioritised wound up with lower vaccination rates than average because metaphorically they couldn't run fast enough. So, so yes, it was never announced. We never abandoned phase 1A, 1B. And my ridiculous middle-class healthy male story is that I was slow to get vaccinated because I knew people who were in phase 1A and 1B who hadn't been vaccinated. So I thought I mustn't be eligible yet, right? <laughs> so I missed the memo stuff it it's catch and kill your own get out there and get a vaccine uh and you know i nearly missed out on getting my vaccine because by one day because my, my son was in an exposure site uh at Lynham and I, I nearly didn't get out in time so i could have been exposed to the virus because i'd postponed i wasn't hesitant i i just knew that 1a and 1b hadn't been finished yet so i hadn't actually tried to get myself booked in so there was no plan there was just a rush. And, and just quickly with Qantas, yep, Qantas somehow got 20,000 of their staff and their families vaccinated with Pfizer in May and June this year. Uh, in Sydney, they basically set up shop at Sydney Airport and got 20,000 of their people vaccinated. We didn't vaccinate the, the transport worker, the limo driver. We didn't vaccinate people with disabilities, but Alan Joyce, good on him. I'm not complaining about this. He, somehow he got all the Pfizer Qantas needed. And when we accidentally, which wasn't an accident, FOI is revealed, when we accidentally vaccinated 163 boys from Joey's College, one of the most expensive private schools in Australia, when that blew up, the Department of Health said, oh, it's because some of them were Indigenous. Now, a few of them were, and Indigenous kids were eligible for earlier vaccination, but the FOIs revealed later it had nothing to do with that. It was that a senior bureaucrat had said, can I get all the boys at Joey's vaccinated with Pfizer, please? Yep, sure, no problem. And when it blew up, the group that we were allegedly prioritising were used as the excuse for why we accidentally vaccinated 160 of the most privileged kids in the country. Mm. Brendan, talking there about Qantas getting that access and private school boys getting access, I mean, looking at Wilcannia, you said you're a small, tight-knit community. Like, that just must be 
so disappointing to hear how easy it was for other elements of the population to get it when Will Kanye was supposed to be a priority and just you ended up on your own effectively. Yeah, look, it, it's actually it's actually once again a common element that we do here as as First Nations people. You know that um, you know it's it's not what you know or who you know, and 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 you know what Richard said. You know is is a very common thing. You know um, it's sad to hear that our First Nations people can be used as an excuse for you know people that have so, have more of a um a power or anything to get you know that influence and everything and yet a small community is left out in the cold and you know in something that richard said i i kind of agree you know it was, it was that first come first serve you know if you can race to it and and our committee wasn't about how fast we could run to is that we we were so isolated that we've got a distance to be to to the closest vaccination that could have been was you know a minimum of 200 kilometers so we you know and and our town is a majority of low income people so we actually had everything against us you know and and this is sort of like that continuous issue that we were trying to uh, let the government know and and we actually had a meeting um a community meeting with elders and youth in in march uh 2020 to to make this awareness happen and all that to the government and in fact my my health actually uh sent a letter out about you know everything uh, including health and the uh, social health crisis so there was there was no excuses for government to say hang on you know you know we need to prioritize and get it out to Wilkenia kenya and get it out to other communities such as Bree and Walget, who also got affected as well as much as Wilkenia. kenya and you know from us you know is this is when all when the um the COVID did come, the attention came of Walt Kenya was then. It wasn't prior. It wasn't when we needed it the most. And it was when the effect happened because they knew, the government knew at that time, they did not do it, their job. Yeah, and then it was concentrated on the cities, on the regional areas. But remote communities especially were what I believe and I felt very strong in my, um, in my spirit that we were forgotten because we were not their high priority. Yeah. Um, but as you said, you know, there was excuses. And Brendan, I was gonna ask, yeah. sorry, because, yeah. um, you know, it's very clear that you weren't a priority and the whole strategy of Aboriginal community controlled health organizations was to keep the virus out until you could vaccinate the population the same way that we've been trying to do with the states. But that didn't happen. I just want you to tell us a little bit um, about, you know, you talked about the overcrowding, that the fact that when the virus hit the community, it ended up having to be the community that responded. There wasn't anywhere for people to isolate if they had the virus so that they didn't infect other people in their household. Like, what were some of the real problems? Um, you know, could people go to the shops to do their grocery shopping? What was the community having to deal with when the outbreak hit in Wilcania? Yeah, well, that, that the, the biggest issue was when a one person could have been um, identified positive in the COVID, because we had nowhere to go, they made an assumption that if one person had the COVID, then the whole family could be affected. So that means that they, they use this, um, what they, their excuse or their reasoning in their eyes was, well, they can all isolate together. But we actually had evidence that not everyone in that one house was all positive. But they they help provide or increase the, um, the COVID and everything by putting that positive into the same household. And when we're talking about household, we're talking about averaging 12 people per house. We're talking about young babies, uh, children, men and women, our elders and our vulnerable people. So then from there, that none of them were allowed to go shopping. And as a First Nations people, we we have always looked after our elders where young people would go see the see their grandfather and say, what do you need food in that? We could not do that. We had to stay away. So that means that with one shop that we had in our community, we couldn't, they the people could not get access. So what what then happened was the emergency uh, committee, the local emergency um 
came into play and then we got donations and then and, and it had to be local people that stepped up. And it, once again, um, our radio station, even though they were the voice at the time, we also became uh, the frontline workers with other volunteers to help provide the food to our people. And we're talking about large families. We had to provide uh, medical assistance, even though we had... Um, we had health organisations there, but it was local people that knew what house to go to because we had police coming in, uh, the Australian Defence Force. They did not know the community, so they we were dependent on. And it was up to us to provide every kind of assistance. But while you go through it, and I was in the front line, and it really damaged me and impact because two things did is while I'm there looking at my families and, and friends, you know, that I've been with for 20 years, I saw I saw um, the, a father who was so depressed because he woke up every morning wanting, no, uh, scared that his child could die, you know, and we had to go through, uh, I'm sorry, um, we had to go through so much of the trauma of our First Nation people in the community that I had to sit there and talk to them, but I had to be at a distance, could not hug, hug, hug them. And, and this is what, not just myself, but all the volunteers, all the young kids that could not get to their families, um, all, the, all the elders that could not even see their grandkids. And, and we never had the services that you would see in, in other communities, such as even having Facebook time, because the internet was so low that you couldn't even connect through the internet, you know, through FaceTime or whatever social media outlet. So it means our, our community, our people are so alone in this time of need. But the one thing I will always give for Kenya and why I love this community was the resilience that we went through, because Doing that, doing that too much, we went from one person to 153, and then we went back to zero. So the resilience of the local um, community people, the, our, our people that did not have the vaccines, who were uh, affected, did the right thing. It took a bit of time because being First Nations and social inclusive, we had to learn how to stay away. It's not easy. But during that time, you got to also recognise that um, we were blamed. You know, we actually had health organisations comparing comparing our, our funeral that first came, uh, first brought the COVID in. It wasn't local people that had the COVID. It was someone coming out of out of another community that was infected that brought it into our town. The very same fear that we had, but then. The health organisation said, "Well, Kenya, you know, had a had a funeral which was five hundred people. That was lies. Yeah, you know? it was a young person, and we we kept our social distancing. But a fam a, 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 a group came in from out of town, infected it. The other thing that was highlighted, which was wrong, was the um, the day of the funeral was a day before lockdown happened." in our community but that was not that was not shown it was actually you know blamed again yeah. so so during that time at the beginning and then when we finally got the full uh, support by the Australian Defence Force uh, those camper vans that came in it was a little too late yeah but for us as frontline workers we were happy that they uh, they did come because and at that time we had to work with them to to um, maintain and and trying to contain the um, the um, pandemic from spreading even worse. So having those camper vans did come and everything, yeah. but the social housing issue stayed. And now that the pandemic is finished, we now got to say we have to worry about the second wave now. Yeah, now, we still got the social housing issue, and we still have the health of not having. Um, we've got a lot more that people got their first and second vaccination thanks to Royal Flying Doctors, Mara My Health and our local team. But we're not in a stage we are protected. Yeah. And, and no strategy has been came back to the local people for local solutions to 
find a prevention or some kind of protection. And if that pandemic comes again, we are feeling that we can lose someone. We are very lucky. We have lost no one at this point of time. Yeah, that's an amazing feat, isn't it, Brendan, considering the size of the outbreak and... Obviously, it's really difficult for you to talk about it. So we really, again, I just want to say how much we appreciate you sharing that experience with us today. I'll come back to you again in a second and we'll go to questions from the audience just shortly. But Elle, coming back to you, um, that experience that Brendan is talking about just within Wilcania, you know, we've been talking about how um, the disability community really had to support itself as well. Um, what kinds of barriers were people with disabilities facing in terms of access to vaccinations or countering disinformation um, where outbreaks did happen? Was it um, that community that swung in to support itself as well, similar to what happened in Wilcania? Absolutely. So um, during the pandemic uh, last year, there were a lot of calls for more accessible information. So by the time we got to the vaccine rollout, it wasn't like we hadn't been banging on about this for a year already. Um, there was still wasn't information provided in a, a format called Easy Read, which is really helpful for people um, with intellectual disability. Um, there was often not Auslan interpreters available or Auslan videos provided. Um, a lot of the information was provided in really difficult to access ways. Um, there weren't plain English. Um, a lot of the vaccine booking things weren't accessible um, either. So there were some really basic barriers to accessing just, you know, how do we book a vaccine and where do we go? So, um, and that was a huge challenge and one that wasn't, you know, wasn't a new challenge either. That's the, one of the most frustrating parts of this vaccine rollout. You know, during COVID, we raised all of these issues time and time again. And, um, you know, there was we did a lot of work uh, in Facebook groups, on Twitter, in social media, in translating government announcements. So what the public health orders meant for people with disability, what we could and couldn't do. Um, so for many of us, we use um, disability support. So we have people coming into our homes all the time. Um, and so that's a particular issue that really wasn't addressed again during the pandemic or this time for the vaccine. Could we ask our support workers to be vaccinated? Um, could we insist what happens if they say no? Does that mean we get no supports? All of that kind of stuff. And so for people with disability also who live in um, you know, group settings or working group settings like, you know, sheltered workshops or go to day programs, um, all of that kind of stuff. You know, as Brennan has said, when lots of people live together, it is a huge risk of spreading the virus. And many people with disability live in what we call congregate care, you know, every single day. And, you know, that's what, I mean, this has been my frustration about it. Within the Disability Royal Commission um, released their report and we had some Senate inquiries into covid that's how we found out that the government had made, you know, the Department of Health had made a deliberate decision to deprioritise people with disability and then not to tell us, not to tell, us, you know, people with disability, our organisations, families, not to let anybody know. And so people were floundering around going, what is going on and why aren't we, you know, in the priority list? What is the problem? So, um, and it's been extremely frustrating. It's been one of those things where um, the other part of it is that we don't know the impact on this fully for people with disability. So the data in the UK showed that 60% of people who died from COVID were people with disability, 60%. Um, but we don't know what the results are in Australia because we don't keep that kind of data. And the data that we do have is about people who use NDIS supports, um, but we, we do, data we do have shows that there are still 22% of people who live in group homes who are still not fully vaccinated. And there's only 77% of NDIS, people who use NDIS supports who are over 16, which is only half of the people who would use the NDIS who are actually vaccinated. And people like me who get my supports in different ways, who are immunocompromised, there's no data, like there's no data being reported. We don't know, apart from those incredibly awful announcements that we hear all the time that people who died with underlying health conditions, which we presume is disabled people, you know, and we just hear that every day on the news and 
just go, well, then another one, another one of us has died and, yeah. and yet we're not counted as a whole. So our community has done a whole lot of work around advocating. We've done petitions. We've done direct lobbying of politicians. We've done protests and media and there's been a whole lot of sort of speaking out and raising awareness. People use the Royal Commission as well. People wrote about their experiences of being able to, not being able to get the vaccine, not having access to accessible information and not being included and how that has felt during the pandemic and the vaccine rollout. So we've used kind of lots of different mechanisms to raise these issues, but we're, we're about to repeat the whole thing again with the third vaccine dose, you know, because again, there is no plan to get disabled people vaccinated with the third dose. There is no plan for people who are living in congregate environments like group homes or aged care. And there's no data being kept on people who are immunocompromised and how they're getting access to it. So it just feels like we're about to repeat for the third time all of the same mistakes. Yeah, look, and uh, I'm obviously not the Prime Minister, but I'm so sorry, Elle and Brendan, that that's happened to your communities. It's really just appalling to hear. And as you say, those distressing comments, you know, we all were watching those press conferences every day and that underlying conditions is obviously just trotted out like, what else could you expect if someone had underlying conditions? But those are the people that we were presumably supposed to protect in the priority um, rollout. I'm going to go to questions from the audience now. We've got more than 500 people on the line with us. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Uh, the first question that I've got is from uh, Richard Joseph, and it's probably for you, Richard. Do you think that the cascade of issues and failures on the vaccination rollout stemmed from the initial reluctance by our leaders to secure Pfizer at the start? Richard, do you want to take that one? Oh, absolutely. I mean, add that to the list. <laughs> you know, uh, sorry to plug in the essay, but I really like we need to go back and look at the totality of what happened. So I talked about the fact that we didn't build the vac uh, the quarantine centres. We didn't prioritise the border workers. We didn't even make them wear masks. Uh, and yes, it was an explicit. So there's three specific failures that led to the Sydney lockdowns. Um, but yeah, in addition to that, we 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 crippled. We, we, we quibbled with Pfizer over the upfront cost of being first in the queue. So while the Prime Minister told us we are at the head of the queue, his department, his government was actually quibbling with Pfizer who said, look, the down payment's 100 million bucks. And if you guys don't end up uh, approving the vaccine, you know, that's, that's on you. But if you want to be first in the queue, you can be there. And we quibbled. Now, uh, we kind of bet on AstraZeneca and that's, that's fine. But, you know, usually what we do when, when, when the stakes are this high is you spread your risks around. And AstraZeneca was a good vaccine and it was a safe vaccine. But if we had have spread our risk more, uh, and similarly, even with Moderna, we don't talk much about Moderna in Australia, but we were very slow to get on that train as well. So, these are all concrete, identifiable choices made by Scott Morrison and the costs in human life are enormous and the costs to the economy are enormous. And, you know, for less than the price of the car park rort scheme, we could have been first in the queue with Pfizer, you know, and at the beginning, again, you know, I go through it all, uh, the chronology, but at the beginning of the year, we had announcement after announcement of 10 million doses, 20 million doses, 50 million doses. So how come we had the supply problem? <laughs> and the answer is it was all nonsense. We weren't securing the supply up front. We were a bit like climate action. It was all going to happen in the future. Well, what we needed was vaccines in the present. Pfizer offered that and we quibbled with them while wasting enormous amounts of money on far less important things. Yeah, thanks, Richard. The next question is from Kate Crawford. And Brendan, I might direct this one to you. It says, what responsibility and change is needed from health and from the health minister, Greg Hunt, to prevent this from happening again with a third wave? Um, how does the community in Wilcannia feel now? Do you think you're prepared for another wave or are you still just kind of hanging out there waiting for it to come back? Um, um, earlier on, I, ex I explained um, uh, about the impact of the COVID, like a cyclone. And to me, I feel like right now we're in the eye of the cyclone. You know, we've kind of got through one um, uh, dramatic um, sort of like storm and right now we're here 
wait. And we know that there will be a second wave. We know it because it, it, it's, it's just too powerful this at the moment. Or I don't know if the powerful is the right word for it, but we know that the COVID is going to be here for quite a while. And we, we, we actually had a meeting again saying, okay, where do we go from here now? You know, and social housing is, a, you know, is, is one of the biggest issues we're doing. So we want, we were saying, you know, we need to prepare our, our community to be ready for the second wave to have a, a appropriate accommodations um, done. But houses aren't gonna, it's not gonna be done um, in the next few days. But what I saw, which I kind of felt was wrong by the government was their quick response when they brought out those camper vans. That, you know, for me, those camper vans was a quick solution, but it wasn't, it was not, it was only a short-term solution when something they could have done is bought containers that, that would, could be fitted. Now those containers, could end up staying in our community and provide um, uh, 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 much needed accommodation for young families and, and help us through the overcrowding and everything. Mm. And it should have been the strategies that the government should have put in place instead of these camp events, because the camp events have left town. To us as First Nation people, we see that they, they've left them, they're now gone and um, that could be cleaned and auctioned and then provided for people who's, you know, has got money. That's the way we saw it because they did not think about First Nations people for a second uh, a wave for communities such as well, Kenya, once again, Bree Warren and all that. And, and also then the health organisations, the government's going, okay, it's done. We're kind of feeling happy, you know, that we've got great positive outcomes. But we are now living again waiting for that fear. And we do not know as community people how to deal with it again. We were very lucky that we got through it without a loss of life in rural Kenya. We did lose family um, and, and my heart goes out to every single um, First Nation and community people within Australia that did lose lives and, and especially our vulnerable people. But right now, there was nothing set in place. There was nothing, you know, we had Mr. Um, Hazard come out to Kenya. He addressed the social housing issue that was that was highlighted, but there's been no conversation since. Yeah. Now, where are we now and where do we go from here? And our community, not, not just the leaders, but our community people don't have ideas, don't have answers, but we do need, we do need, uh, results and we do need solutions yeah. and it needs to be immediately that's all yeah. I know um uh L I'll come to you in just a tick but um Richard that strikes me that uh you talk about in the SN I think Brendan's spoken about before the fact that New South Wales Health looked at that issue of overcrowding and basically said that was a pre-existing problem so we're not going to do anything to fix it but during the pandemic we've seen governments drop hundreds of billions of dollars, if not at the very least tens of billions, you already said, you know, um, compared to the carport rort scheme, some of these programs were kind of chump change. Like that's a problem. We can fix that in Wilcania, the overcrowding problem. That's well within the remit of government to do. Why is it that some of those things that we did initially, like housing homeless people, you know, have already seemed to fall in by the wayside. Does that make sense to an economist economically? No, it's got nothing to do with economics. It's got to do with our actual priorities, not the stated priorities, the revealed priorities, the, the what we do priorities, not the what we say priorities. So let's be clear, we accidentally gave $40 billion, $40,000 million in JobKeeper. We accidentally gave $40 billion to companies whose revenues were rising and we thought, oh, no biggie, look, we'll just let them hang on to that, okay, because it's a crisis and we're shoveling money out the door, hurry, so, you know, all good, no hard feelings. You hang on to the $40 billion, Jerry Harvey, et cetera. Imagine if we accidentally spent too much money on housing in Wilcannia, accidentally <laughs> spent some money, solved the problem, and then went, oh, COVID's passed, but, hey, look, you've still got much better housing than you used to. That's something we could be proud of, but no, no, no. 
no, that wouldn't that wouldn't be fiscally responsible and money doesn't grow on trees, you know. So, so let's be crystal clear. Australia is one of the richest countries in the world and we can afford to do anything we want and we can afford to spend $40 billion supporting growing companies. We can afford to trade up from uh, $90 billion submarines to whatever it takes submarines. We can afford to give $100 billion worth of tax cuts and we tell ourselves we quote can't afford, you know, to in, to invest in uh, better housing in the middle of a crisis. That when the crisis passes would leave people with better housing. This has nothing to do with economics. <laughs> Again, what we need to stop paying attention to what people like Scott Morrison say and focus exclusively on what they do. And they shoveled money onto people they liked. They vaccinated people they cared about and they accidentally didn't vaccinate and didn't house vulnerable groups. That tells you about the priorities. Um, Elle, the next question I've got here is for you. It's from Kirsten Anker, and she asks, was the vaccine rollout to people with disability managed by the department itself or was it outsourced? Is there anything else that you can tell us about that? Do we actually know? We do. Uh, yes, both is the answer. So, yes, there was a whole lot done, decisions made by the Department of Health, um, but there was a whole lot of outsourcing as well. So Aspen Healthcare and Sonic were the two companies contracted to do the key rollouts for um, people who live in group homes and kind of congregate care. Um, but then there weren't particular contracts actually given for 1A and 1B at all. So um, it's been very interesting. We have made a number of, um, the organisations have had made a number of extremely, as Richard said, modest requests for money to actually resource the work that disabled people, our families and our organisations have been doing for what getting close to two years now with no extra resources at all. And there hasn't been one single cent coming to us to actually, who know how to communicate with our community, but also disability advocacy organisations who know how to reach people with disability in really marginalised uh, situations, such as boarding houses, such as leaving jail, um, you know, such as living on the streets. So who are, you know, still not by getting access to the vaccine. So we have been very clear around, we are the experts on disabled people. Who knew disabled people are the experts on disabled people? Um, and so instead of giving multi-million dollar contracts to um, companies to roll out uh, vaccines, you know, why don't you give it to us and actually let us run the rollout? Hmm. Um, Richard, I want to come back to you. There's a couple of different people in the questions and in the chat asking about accountability. Obviously, the essay is one way to go back over and kind of um, account for some of those decisions and who made them. But um, how important is accountability going to be to avoid making similar mistakes um, in future? Or do you think that's just a calculation that the government has made? Uh, look, obviously, I think accountability is important, but, but let's be clear, a lot of these things weren't mistakes, they were choices, right? Now, I happen to think they're a mistake. I think that not building standalone quarantine centres for a couple of hundred million bucks was a mistake. I happen to think that not vaccinating limo drivers and frontline border first workers was a mistake. But maybe the kids that got vaccinated at Joey's, maybe all the Qantas staff, maybe uh, the recipients of $40 billion in JobKeeper, they don't think that's a mistake. So, you know, I, we have to be very careful. We live in a democracy. It's not ideal, but the most of the accountability comes from who we elect and re-elect. And Scott Morrison actually thinks he can go to the next election with a tick next to his name saying, did all right there, son. You know, now, if a majority of Australians agree with him, uh, then that's the main accountability. Uh, and if a majority of Australians think, wow, how was it that the priority groups have lower vaccination rates than the non-priority groups, you were just making words and flapping your mouth. You weren't actually turning uh, the, the resources of the nation state into the problem that you'd identified. So yes, accountability is really important, but we don't just need a, a parliamentary inquiry that says tisk tisk. We need to look ourselves, our country, our neighbours in the mirror and understand that it's actually up to us as voters to say, was that a job well done or wasn't it? 
And yeah, certainly to hear Scott Morrison talk about the vaccine rollout is not a man exhibiting contrition. Uh, it's, it's, it's a man blaming victims, blaming victims for their underlying conditions or for being a bit slow to get vaccinated, you know? So we sympathise with them, but let's be clear, underlying conditions, unvaccinated. Let's not look at what I said in January and what I said in March and look how I catastrophically failed to get everyone vaccinated by October like I promised I would. Let's not talk about that. Let's talk about their underlying conditions. It's, it's, it's neoliberalism 101. It's victim blaming. And the guy who made the big decisions is actually giving himself a little pat on the back and trying to move on to the next thing to bollocks up. Um, Brendan, I want to come to you before we finish. We've only got a couple of minutes to go, but... Um... You know, it still strikes me as extraordinary. You know, you're the manager of the local radio station and you became a frontline worker here. Um, obviously, that experience has really deeply affected you. Uh, you've already talked about kind of the fear that the community has that nothing has changed. And obviously, New South Wales is lifting restrictions because the whole of the state uh, as vaccination rates um, uh, are looking okay. Um, how is Will Kenya looking and what are your hopes for the future there? Well, the one thing Will, Will Kenya has, Will Kenya has always been um, uh, centralised with a lot of issues that have been based from government's decisions. Prior to, prior to the um, pandemic, we actually had no water in our, you know, in our barca, which people know as the darling, you know. So the one thing our community does do is that it, during crises such as what we've experienced, um, and that is, we find that we come together a lot better. Um, you know, as we said, we are families. So in the times of this, we, we become more resilient. Uh, we've, we, we, we become more united with the way we care for each other. I think that the only biggest issue was during the pandemic, it, we, we had to find a way staying connected by not being connected. So the radio station doing its job, the health organisations that were on the, on the ground helped by assisting us. In it. And I think, you know, our town has now gone, OK, we, we've, we know we have the strength to move forward. But what we do need is we do need that accountability is, is to be actioned, right? The, the government, no, they did wrong to communities such as Will Kenya. They did wrong to our vulnerable people, our disability people, and, and the and the and the comments they made, you know, you know, that, that we are prioritized, and yet it hasn't done it. So they know they are. Instead of being going, okay, you're the blame, you're the blame. Come to the table with us right now and let's get a local solution. Listen to us. Let us learn from what you've made the mistakes. You, um, I, someone uh, said earlier about if it, a second wave is a similar one. If a second wave comes, it's not a similar one. It's worse for not learning from what happen, has happened now. And the other thing is, is that we are actually a community that can show the show all the other communities of prevention. So not only what they need to talk to us, they need to talk to every single other community, listen to the local solution, but act on it. And that's going to make the difference for our people to feel safe, that our people feel like they are part of an Australian society that people care of. Because the true Australians are the people that donated, that gave up their times and everything. They're the ones that made us feel valued. But right now, we are in a place where are we going to be valued? Because if we are, come to the table, listen, act, and then spread it so that every other community can learn from what has happened with us. And thank I think you. that's the issue. Yeah, I'm really sorry. We've got to wrap it up there. But I want to thank all of you so much for your time today. Uh, Brendan Adams, L. Gibbs, and Richard Dennis. This is the front page of Richard's essay. You can find that in the November issue of the monthly. It should be in all news agents and good bookstores near you. Um, I, I really want to thank everyone for tuning in today. I feel like this was a really important webinar. We seem to be pushing full steam ahead, but we're still leaving a lot of people behind. 
Um, so thanks again, everyone, for joining us. We've got more exciting webinars coming up over the next few weeks. Next week will be our regular poll position webinar with Guardian Australia and Essential Media. That'll be focusing on Glasgow and climate change. The week after that, we're delighted to announce, it's not up on the website yet, but we're going to be talking to the ACT Chief Minister, Andrew Barr, about pandemic leadership. Obviously, the ACT has taken quite a different approach to, for example, the New South Wales government. Really looking forward to that one. That'll be up on our website hopefully later today. Make sure you've subscribed to our podcast, Follow the Money, where we explain big economic issues in plain English. This week's episode, I talked to Ben Oakwes, um, who was live from Glasgow at the time, about Scott Morrison's disastrous trip uh, to the G20 and to Glasgow. Um, I want to thank you all uh, for your time today. Don't forget to check out Wilcania River Radio. Um, L Gibbs writing is on Crokey and elsewhere. Um, thanks again to all of our panellists. Don't forget to pick up a, a, this issue of the monthly and hopefully we'll see you all next week. Take care out there, everyone. Take care of one another and we'll see you soon. Bye. Thanks, Thank Em. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Thank you, everyone.